by way of introduction, I'm, I was pleased to see some of the publications here from IAS recently. And I think one of the one of the best, best places where my lecture today dovetails is with some of the work that Dr. Jensen, the Jody, has done. Uh, in particular, because one of her key areas is to look at the uncertainties that are produced within globalization, uh, and that fact of pervasive uncertainty is really the starting point for me for this lecture. Um, now, as the title should suggest, ultimately, I want to veer off into asking where Shakespeare might be relevant in addressing some of the current uh, uncertain dilemmas, let's call them. Uh, and none of these are simple solutions, uh, to be sure, but uh, this is my area of academic investigation, namely the application of narrative and of literature uh, to philosophical political topics. And so uh, this is, so I'd like to start um, by establishing sort of what, what I understand modern conditions to be, such that we would need to have a conversation about uh, you know, the sorts of devices, tasks, strategies that we would need to negotiate them and among other uncertainties, I have created darkness. <laughs> this, is, this is an entire allegory for what we will be speaking of. Okay. Um, let me name four key current events. Like, maybe they're not events so much as some of the more dynamics uh, or tensions or problems, but um, Coronavirus, on everyone's mind, without question, affecting many, if not most. Uh, refugee flows and a crisis of borders. Climate crisis. Uh, and cyberspace and its regulation. And by that, I could mean many things. I'm thinking especially of surveillance, data collection, and so forth. For example, with respect to cybersecurity, Allow me to quote from a brand new study published by Oxford University Press in which the authors there write the following about the current dilemmas with cybersecurity. The authors write that there is a clear anxiety as to the need for a legal system to be proactive and experiment with and develop the establishment of a legal framework capable of adequately responding to the social and economic challenges raised by blockchain technology. I would emphasize to you here the initial key statement by these authors that founds the entire book, namely that there is a clear anxiety about this. Or another current example, uh, an example this time of the conditions under which many young people, or especially young people, uh, currently experience their relationships to politics. And this is in the emergence of so-called climate anxiety. Uh, I would turn your attention to a Guardian article from February 10, uh, this last month, uh, by Matthew Taylor and Jessica Murray on the rise of climate anxiety. Just a quick quotation from them. The physical impact of the climate crisis is impossible to ignore, but experts are becoming increasingly concerned about another, less obvious consequence of the escalating emergency, the strain it is putting on people's mental well-being, especially the young. Psychologists warn that the impact can be debilitating for the growing number of people overwhelmed by the scientific reality of ecological breakdown and for those who have lived through traumatic climate events, often on the climate front line in the global south. Uh, the same article quotes Dr. Patrick Kennedy Williams, who's an Oxford clinical psychologist, who works now on precisely this phenomenon of climate anxiety. Uh, and he works on it now for the past two years not because he initially found it himself, but because colleagues at Oxford and other universities, and especially parents of young people, were coming to him consistently again and again with these questions, what to do with the psychological well-being of my kids in the face of the climate crisis. So again, climate anxiety and its rise. The thesis point that I want to begin with here in sort of doing a quick diagnosis of what I think some of the key points of the current 
social and political climate are about, uh, involve establishing the fact that we live in an anxious world. And it's an anxious world because there is more ambiguity than there's ever been before. Or, to maybe put it different and, and perhaps not quite as historically problematically, uh, I don't know if there's more ambiguity out there, but we experience the ambiguity differently. Uh, a first possible example of this uh, could be made with reference to the work of Zygmunt Bauman, the concept of a liquid society or a liquid modernity, in which security, or sorry, insecurity, uncertainty, and individualism are dominant. The roots of that crisis are, are, tr are um, traced back by Bauman to the end of ideologies that characterized the 70s and the 80s and the previous, dec uh, in the previous uh, century, and the economic crisis of 2008. Um, other major emergencies converse in, converge in the same apocal change, including transition from material to um, the tendency towards immaterial labor, or what others might call communicative labor, uh, the reality of insecurity and the phenomenon of migrations, uh, and the social consequences of those, I think, are clear to everyone. Uh, the, the results and effects of globalization certainly are part of what Bauman uh, is raising to the fore. And in particular, then, uh, in adding globalization, we assume here with Bauman a significant responsibility for at least the partial breakdown of the relationship between politics and power, which is considered to be central in the crisis of the nation states. Um, I won't go through all of this piece with Bauman. It's really just an initial reference, one that we could dig into further, one that any of us could dig into further. But the metaphor of liquidity is effective. It recalls key elements of the world we live in, um, even and especially rapidity, speed, in other words, and permeability, right, the porousness of borders, and mutability, right, frequent, the frequency of change. Another reason here, moving on to the, uh, well, I'm still under your first point there, but another point about this anxious world that we live in. We experience anxiety so much these days because of the essential tenuousness or precarity, whether perceived or real, of those things that structure our lives and structure our identities. Uh, it's interesting that one of the great virtues within modern life today is not conformity, as it may have been before, right? the ability to stand with others in solidarity about certain things, but in fact, now it is flexibility, adaptability. Um, an example here uh, that I think most of us can relate to, if you lose your job, if you lose your job, you're confronted with many immediate, obvious, and familiar dangers. But amongst the fear that one has in this arises also a certain kind of anxiety beyond it, right? a general disorientation, uh, such as what one feels in confronting the possibility that one is no longer properly and adequately trained for one's own profession. And how do I move on to a different profession or even uh, get updated within my own. So it's my contention that the general way in which we tend to experience anxiety is changing in profound ways, I think. Ways that have serious social, political, and ethical ramifications. And ultimately, to really follow this one out is a different lecture. One that needs to take a very hard right turn into different kinds of analysis. But I want to give just a few um, a few tastes of, of sort of what I mean by the claim that I think the experience of anxiety is changing a little bit. Um, the experience, I think, has shifted its foundations to the point where we need to confront the possibility that this kind of uncanny and uniquely modern form of anxiety may challenge the very traditional definitions of anxiety that we've come to take for granted. And I will try to come back to that point then to unravel it a bit. So, um, if this is a little bit by way of digression, let me at least clarify that here's one sort of sidebar thesis point I have. That the experience of fear, which we have, and we have it frequently, is more and more consistently anxiety-ridden. And in a kind of grammatical way, 
The simple difference between fear and anxiety is that fear has a distinct object, and anxiety doesn't. Anxiety is supposedly objectless, or you know, with the philosopher Kierkegaard, perhaps you associate anxiety with the future, with temporality, uh, or with Heidegger and the possibility of death as we approach it, of nothingness. Uh, but again, ultimately, I find these to be a little bit more algebraic or grammatical types of definitions. Uh, and I want to look for something a little bit more tangible. Um, though it's been notably this way for some time, I think the current global economic crisis um, conveniently demonstrates this time and again in a very obvious and concrete way. Um, whereas in earlier eras, with variously organized forms of life, one could safely assume that some form of substantial community might help to buffer us, um, act as a buffer between oneself and the raw presence of the world. Uh, if nothing else, substantial communities used to hide certain things for us, hide access to those groundless moments, those uncertainties, the bare facts of life, um, among those facts, death. This was always the purview of spirituality. It was always the purview of religion before. But these substantial communities are dissolving in some ways. Um, in other ways, and key ways, not. And I will try to mention that later, too. But their power is used to muffle this experience of anxiety. Right? But that's swiftly waning now. Uh, there's a longer appeal, I think, that we could make here in explaining this to different types of dangers. Uh, the <laughs> the Prussian philosopher Immanuel Kant, when he speaks about uh, the concept of the sublime in his third critique, he speaks about two different kinds of dangers. One is he speaks about particular dangers, things that will can immediately hurt you. Things, for example, like you know a you know I don't know what warring soldiers outside, and so you build a tower like this to protect yourself in, uh, or a snow slide. I think is the concept. Is the example that Kant gives. But for particular dangers, there are particular and concrete protections. Fear is the affective counterpart here. Uh, but then there are absolute dangers, as Kant speaks about them, truly sublime dangers, where there is no shelter as such. And again, religious experience is the traditional space of shelter in this regard. And then anxiety is the generally accepted term for how absolute danger is experienced. But clearly, today, I think we no longer assume the sheltering power of these substantial communities. It's not to say that they're not there, but I don't think we assume them. Thus, we are continually bumping up against the imprecise context of our existence. So, again, one of the claims here, I think, in substantiating this point here is that we do no longer assume the sheltering power of these substantial communities. We have fewer fixed customs, the speed of change, the speed of information. Some of you are doing exactly this kind of work here. Uh, mobility of jobs, of places, of living spaces, etc. cetera. Uh, there is simply a repeatedly innovated reality. The fact that we're live streaming this, the fact that universities are suddenly going all online in the wake of an immediate coronavirus transformations in the way in which we immediately uh, relate to one another are happening you know, in the blink of an eye, or in this case, you know, in the moment of a quick decision made by administrators. Uh, there's a multicultural world that's out there, and national identities are under stress with it, some flourishing, some not flourishing in the midst of that transformation. And the result of all of this, and again, I'm moving quickly here, but the result of all of this, uh, these social, these economic, these political stresses, is anxious societies. But I would argue here that the roots of our current pervasive anxiety derive not from these changing phenomena per se, but from our responses to them. And in other words, what really causes us anxiety today is the attempt to get rid of anxiety. And that's what I want to look a little bit more at now. So what does that mean? 
in some respects. It means that more than ever we seek desperately and cling to consolation. Jim, you and I were talking about this yesterday with respect to the moral fundaments, right? Um, this can take many forms, but mostly it's the forms uh, or form of a supposed certainty. It's something that we feel was an absolute that can be grasped and held and pointed at. In politics, we find this in the form of the rise of certain kinds of nationalisms, the rise of populism, which is fueled by emotion, some rational, some irrational discourse, fear-mongering at times. This fear of the other in Europe is often experienced as racism, xenophobia, bigotry, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. Unfortunately, the list goes on. In many places, especially in the country from which I still hold a passport, the United States, religious fundamentalism is one of these places where we find the securing of truth and identity and the securing of it for oneself by denying the freedom of truth to others. We see it in the polarization of public discourse, in the disappearance of the public sphere. Now, this has been slowly eroding for quite a long time now, but the rise of social media obviously has changed this. A certain kind of loss of empathy, sensitivity has come in its way. I think we see this uh, reach for certainty in some ways in anti-intellectualism as it seems to grow. Um, the association that complexity, complex thinking, complex thoughts, uh, there's an association of that with elitism. Right? Only the elites need this difficulty in their thinking, in their stories, in their art. Uh, and I think this is you know, the essential message of Trumpism in my own opinion, which I can defend after the uh, after the lecture's over, if you wish, but the message of Trumpism to most people is be more dumb. Don't think, just accept what I'm telling you. Right? Don't check it for sure, because it may not be correct information. Uh, and so we also see then in this same kind of anti-intellectualism a certain kind of rise of char charismatic leaders in place of trust in democratic institutions and mechanisms. Uh, it's the, the next point I'll make very quickly. I think it's a wonderful point to get at, but eventually I want to get at Shakespeare. But I think there are also very interesting and long philosophical roots here for this kind of attempt to eradicate anxiety by certainty seeking and in the process producing anxiety. And I think that, excuse me, lies very much in nascent elements of modernity. One single reference here briefly, and then I'll turn away from it. Um, in some of his late lectures uh, in the early 80s, Michel Foucault speaks about the hermeneutics of the subject there. And one of his claims in those lectures is to argue that in the course of Western thinking and education, and he places it precisely at the moment of Descartes and the Cartesian intervention, he suggests that the old Delphic maxim to know yourself became delinked from the idea of caring for yourself which is something that Foucault would contend was always implied in the original Hellenistic understanding of that. The result then for modern science, for modern forms of knowing, if those are delinked, is essentially that the subject's being is not put in question by the necessity of having access to truth. Um, in other words, to try to put it more simply, subjects, individuals, we as selves, are no longer essentially at stake in our own knowledge. We avoid intellectual anxiety at the very foundations of our thinking. In short, for your knowledge to be something other than a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, you actually need to risk not knowing how it will all play out on the other side. And for access to truth, you must risk yourself as you currently know yourself. And that is exactly what we see avoided uh, in many areas and in many ways. Um, modern music, for example. Modern music, modern storytelling. The number of ways in which the same old stories are told again and again and again in just slightly altered forms. I mean, the eternal repetition of the same posed as difference. 
Optically, I think we could speak about linear perspective, the vanishing point, uh, the idea that we see everything from our own perspective, in a sense. Uh, and I think there's a great deal of, of this, actually, that goes on in academic research as well. Right? In other words, the, um, the idea that we're not really asking difficult questions that you know, have answers that might challenge us, but are rather answers that we may not know the answer to when we start, but we have a sense of it you know, already, and we're really just self-fulfilling in what we're doing. Like I said, that's a bit of a digression. I just wanted to make a note that I think there are a lot of sort of rich depths to, to what one can mine in this case, uh, not just sort of quick cultural critique, but rather significant philosophical uh, work to be done, I think, in this area. Moving back now, just very quickly, to, one, to the other side of our comment that I made about anxiety, right? saying that I think it may be experienced differently today. Here's why I think it's a little bit different today. Um, not that there hasn't always been anxiety, but that nowadays it seems to be one of, if not the most common shared experience. Because anxiety is now a strangely public phenomenon. The sort of feeling of not feeling at home, something that when we were speaking yesterday at uh, more sort of informal lecture time, we spoke about with regards to identity. Uh, the feeling in which many feel not entirely at home in their home. Uh, the disillusion that we mentioned earlier about the distinction between the public and the private. Um, the crisis that we are so much at work. Uh, there was recently, again, I, I keep citing The Guardian, but you can find it in many different places. Uh, there was this sort of how-to article just a couple of days ago about how to uh, do better about not bringing your work home. For example, don't open your email in the evening. Right? The number one thing at the end of the list was never, ever open your email in bed. <laughs> but the idea, again, is that work colors, work colors all that you do. You're always at work. And in fact, the more that we are... The more that our labor market requires us to basically just come with accelerated social skills and communication and collaboration and creativity, the more whatever we do socially outside of work in fact makes us better workers. We are simply more and more and more at work. Uh, so this feeling of not feeling at home, that ubiquitous anxiety, involves an oddly public nature. And that's in the face, then, of anxiety as this supposedly most private, most interior, most ineffable of experiences. And, and so the result is that there is no more shared common or public feeling than this anxiety, than not feeling at home. Uh, from Kierkegaard through Heidegger and then a few beyond that lineage, you get the claim that the fundamental attunement of being is anxiety. And this is, you know, like in Heidegger, this is terms like the Findlichkeit. That this is, we are fundamentally attuned in anxiety, but that would, that would mean that this is the most personal, most interior, and in fact, it seems at this point today to be a shared and collective experience. So what is that affect? Is it still anxiety? How are we to understand it? Probably it is. Probably it also isn't in various ways, and I certainly don't have answers to any of that right now. But I wanted to raise this, sort of as points, as questions, uh, as, a, and a, as a set of stops on an initial itinerary, so that the commentary that I now want to make about Shakespeare uh, has a foundation for itself here, something to, to bank it against. So, assuming anxious societies are thusly our condition, what can we learn from Shakespeare about addressing our current social and political conditions. At first glance, choosing to cite Shakespeare to address our modern crisis doesn't seem very relevant at all. In fact, I mean, it would be a very logical response to say, this makes no sense. And I will try to point out why that may be true. Shakespearean language is often obtuse. It's overly image-driven, it's poetic, it's never truly getting to the point, it seems. The historical context of Elizabethan England really could not feel further away in most respects, right? A time when women weren't allowed to even perform on stage, 
Right? The female parts in these plays were written with the intention that they would be played by men or boys. There were no technologies of mechanical reproducibility, let alone digital reproducibility, which meant that every performance, in a sense, was an artwork, even if the script that was, was the same. Uh, you know, people stood in the weather, in the rain, to watch plays. You had to watch by candlelight. Then there are the plots of Shakespeare. Right? Have you Googled one before, maybe in university, when you had to read a Shakespeare play? The plots, they are complex, they are multi-layered, and therefore, they are often also simply convoluted. Let me give you one example, a lesser read play admittedly, but Cymbeline, if you know this play. This includes, and this is just some of the things that are included in this play, star-crossed lovers, a young woman disguised as a boy, lowly peasants who are actually princes, a battle between the king of Britain and Rome, a visitation from a god, Jupiter, a wicked stepmother. There are potions, magic, action, drama, and comedy. So what is the play really about, right? Other ambiguous things about Shakespeare. We don't even know very much about who this guy was. You can think of all the conspiracy theory stories that are currently out there. There is an entire academic Shakespeare industry, which we really should not get into here. Uh, there are some outstanding biographies, uh, one by Stephen Greenblatt, which I would recommend highly. It's called Will in the World. And there are some very poor biographies out there. But speaking of anxiety, here is, in one fell swoop, also a neologism coined by Shakespeare, one fell swoop. In one fell swoop, here's all we know about Shakespeare. He was born in Stratford upon Avon in 1564, married and had children there, went to London, became an actor, wrote plays and poems, returned to Stratford, wrote his will, died in 1616, and was buried. That's all we know from public records. Now, of course, we know a little bit more than that. But we essentially know nothing of real insight into who he was as a person, into his personality. So did Shakespeare really write these plays? I mean, the conspiracy theories are very entertaining, they're very interesting, uh, and again, happy to debate this afterwards if you wish, but uh, some of them may, may be even vaguely plausible. However, the answer is pretty clear that none of them are true, unfortunately. Uh, William Shakespeare wrote the plays. There is absolutely no proof whatsoever of anything else, and the number one reason is because none of the concerns about Shakespeare not having written his own plays were raised until 200 years after his death. So there seems to be little evidence, really. Other things, which we could just mention in passing, but we're not really certain what he looks like. There are very famous images now that have been circulated everywhere. We would all probably claim we do recognize Shakespeare if we're shown a picture, but uh, these portraits aren't very reliable. Um, in fact, the one life-size painted statue which is in the church, the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford upon Avon, where he was buried, would seem to be the most reliable. We know it would have been made by someone who would have known him personally, but entertainingly, the person who, there was someone who it, there retouched this. In other words, they, they wiped all of the original colors and painting clean. It's just a statue that had painting on it, and so now we have no idea what the original looked like. Even the precision of the wording of Shakespeare plays raises questions. Um, you know, Shakespeare and other authors at their time, they wrote plays for theater performances rather than publication. And to print and to sell a book at that time meant basically just giving your play to a rival playwright and troupe. No one wanted to do this, of course. So how did we pass these around? How did we get them written down? How did we get them published? Well, oftentimes, you stole them. Right? You went and you scribbled notes as quickly as you could, or you got notes from other actors, and you pulled them together in all sorts of ways. And as you can easily imagine, uh, this does not uh, inspire confidence in the authenticity of these texts. Uh, and there's also a publishing history that I won't get into as well with Shakespeare. 
that basically says we're not exactly sure you know, what his preferred phrases really would have been. We know that these are mostly accurate, but there's no guarantee to the accuracy. In other words, we don't have any one true, absolutely authentic version of Shakespeare. It's simply up in the air. Now, Shakespeare is arguably the most important cultural and artistic touchstone within the English language tradition. You know, potentially beyond the tradition. But he coined over 2,000 new words uh, that were recorded in his body of work. Now, certainly not all of those stuck. There's weird words in there like betray or insultment. Uh, undeath is another one. But there are many, many that are now relatively commonplace. Antipathy, critical, frugal, dwindle, extract, horrid, vast, hereditary, excellent, eventful, barefaced, assassination, lonely, leapfrog. He goes on. These are all neologisms. Or simply phrases from the plays that got stuck in everyday language, such as what I mentioned before, one fell swoop, or vanishing to thin air, play fast and loose, be in a pickle, budge an inch, remembrance of things past, Cold comfort, to thine own self be true, and so on and so forth. When you put all of this together, the fact that he is this critical touchstone, and yet the language, the historical context, the plots, uncertain biographical details, rather than certainty about Shakespeare and his works, Shakespeare presents us with uncertainty, or to be more precise, ambiguity. In other words, precisely the experience that appears to be driving our symptomatic, anxious, modern behavior. And doesn't this, in fact, make Shakespeare completely irrelevant? It is because of the ambiguity at the heart of Shakespeare's <laughs> words and characters and stories and performances that reading and experiencing Shakespeare today is more relevant than ever. Such will be my argument for the remainder of this. In particular, I want to take a moment to, as it were, readjust our understanding of the term ambiguity. Typically, when we think of ambiguous, we think of an adjective that means uncertain. It's something that has a double meaning, that's shifty, changeable, doubtful. The German, in this case, and actually we can go back to the Latin roots of it too, but the German term for this, Zweideutigkeit, or the, in the Scandinavian languages, uh, they have similar terms for this. But sort of the logical development of that word, I think, is very helpful. Right? Zweideuten, to point in two directions, to interpret in two directions simultaneously. Ambiguity is not uncertainty because we don't know what's there or we don't know if anything's there at all, or because something is missing. Ambiguity applies absolutely to Shakespeare because ambiguity refers to multiple meanings. Manifold possibility, multifarious motivations. In short, it's not that Shakespeare doesn't mean so much to them. <coughs> it's that Shakespeare means too much. It overflows with meaning. It provides us with, in some senses, too many possible meanings. So Shakespeare is an antidote, in some ways, against the anxieties of contemporary life because it uses ambiguity positively and productively, instructively, as a frame for narrating human experience. Now, in truth, most good literature does this. And this isn't necessarily incredibly unique to Shakespeare, but Shakespeare is a convenient, if also very dramatic, example. So for the fun of it, some examples now within Shakespeare of what exactly I mean by this. Shakespearean language. All of the richness of the poetic language, its rhyme and meter, its metaphorical power, the neologisms, the relatively unfamiliar syntax, this all requires us to think strongly and learn at the same time as we feel strongly and identify with characters and situations. Consider the difference, for example, between 
the emotional manipulation of a Shakespearean play. Uh, for example, Hollywood romance versus Romeo and Juliet. Both might involve tragic love, but there's that extra layer of linguistic ambiguity, which means that we cannot reduce the production of those emotions and affects we feel to a simple sound bite. Right? To the simple moment, for example, in which the music cues the emotions that we know we're supposed to feel before the two lovers meet. The language preserves complexity and nuance rather than denying the rational reflection that can and should accompany emotions, so that we're not swept away by political simplifications. Shakespeare, in this sense, is also a kind of antidote for anti-intellectualism, right? by preserving ambiguity, complexity, for positive emotional and intellectual growth. Now, here you have an example from Macbeth up here. Uh, these are Lady Macbeth's lines uh, when she has just received a letter from Macbeth about the prophecy of gaining the crown. Let's turn around a little bit for this. Uh, you can stand up way out here, I guess. I don't know where to stand to read this, but... Uh, obviously, there's a load to say about what is up here, but I'm giving this in this example simply to show how... Ex I mean, the, the essential emotion that's here is very easy to describe, potentially, but it is here given so richly in complexity. Lady Macbeth says, The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal emergence of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. Fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of dark to cry. Hold, hold. What's happening here is Lady Macbeth is basically saying, oh my god, we have a chance to kill the king, let's do it. And I hope I don't feel too badly about it. But that's a soundbite, that's a simple way to explain it. And the fact of the matter is these emotions as such require complex thinking to accompany them. And that's again where I, where I see the lesson of Shakespeare is quite important. Uh, the historical context, then. The seeming distance of that Elizabethan historical context means that when we recognize ourselves in plots and characters, that recognition feels all the more profound for being unexpected. Maybe it's even an uncanny experience, right? To find the familiar in the unfamiliar, almost like deja vu. The same might be said for the plots in which so many crazy things happen. Yet we recognize ourselves in the essential coordinates of the situation. Like Hamlet and teenage angst, or a Midsummer Night's Dream, and the folly of love, the stupid things we, crazy things we do when we're in love, or Macbeth, the problems of fear, the problems of guilt. Shakespeare builds empathy, and builds sympathy, by helping us see ourselves in unique circumstances. Uh, and so here you can see that with Romeo and Juliet. Right, and these famous lines, and I won't go through all of them, but just Juliet's line here, "'Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself not a Montague. What's Montague? Is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part of belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And so Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, Retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name, and for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. Obviously very melodramatic on the part of young uh, Juliet here. But she's making a critical point. This passage asks the audience to understand not just the lover's passion. More importantly, it asks us to understand the grammar of hatred. Capulets and Montagues dislike for one another 
as calcified in the names themselves, and ignoring, of course, all the many, many things that they, in fact, hold in common. Think about Juliet's words, for example, as a way of thinking critically in order to understand how a modern democracy should work in a multicultural world. Another example. The plays, the plots, the themes, the characters tend to present many sides of a situation rather than just one. And the example I've chosen here is The Tempest. The Tempest is a story about power and about a duke that has been uh, kind of unseated and sent away to an island where he has brought his powers with him and he's sort of gained control over this island. Uh, and his daughter has then come with him uh, and then he's sort of discovered there later and gets revenge of a sword on those who did this to him. But it's a story that is, um, like I said, about power, about who has it, about who doesn't. A story about how human relationships have power as a component of what relates one person to another. In a contemporary context, in which the types of power, or at least political power, to which countries and populations are gravitating tend to be more and more authoritarian, more given over to single and strong charismatic leaders who provide certainty and consolation in the form of promises, security, and protection, a kind of simplistic identity, The Tempest is in fact an important play to reread because it considers so many different forms of power and how they operate. Prospero, this unseated leader who takes over the island with his magic and his books and his power, he does dominate, on the one hand, as a colonial master. Right? There are several characters there, Ariel and Caliban, who are slaves to him. They are the locals, the islanders, that Prospero has taken uh, and taken control of. But he also has his daughter there, who he controls. Uh, and Ferdinand is the young man that his daughter Miranda meets while they're on the island. Some of his older colleagues, Antonio and Gonzalo. Prospero controls everyone throughout the plot here, manipulates his daughter into marriage. Did he do it? Or did they really fall in love? Snags others in the web. He foils the plot of Caliban and some others to try to overthrow him. And at the height of all of these powers, right, of, of getting revenge on all of the people who have done these things to him, Rather than joyous, rather than magnanimous, Prospero is melancholic. Uh, a famous, uh, I think I read this here. a famous passage here from Prospero: "You do look, my son, in a mood, sort as if you were dismayed. But be cheerful; our revels now are ended. They're here at a, at a party of this wedding for the daughter." And these actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Sir, I'm vexed. Bear with my weakness, my brain is troubled. Be not disturbed with my infirmity. If you be pleased, retire into my cell and there repose. In a turn or two, I'll walk to still my beating mind. A man who has reached the sort of pinnacle of power, at least within his own range of it, has here found himself sort of, um, impotent in the face of, well, in a certain sense, anxiety. Right? That he has to realize that it doesn't matter what he's done. The baseless, baseless fabric of this vision, all of these things in front of me, these towers, these palaces, these temples, uh, and of course, reference not only to our world, but of course to Shakespeare's Globe Theater right there. Um, he says, it's all going to go away. What does this all mean? Again, this isn't like the number one lesson. This is a guy who did a lot of poor things. 
it brings to the fore the conversation about what power relationships are about in this case. There are other passages here that are crucial. I don't necessarily go through all of them here, but at one point, he suggests that he will simply renounce his power. Right? I will drown my books. I will give up all of this forceful power that I have. At the end, there's even a sense here of forgiveness. Forever having had and abused this power. And perhaps interestingly for understanding forgiveness to be itself a form of power, maybe even an ultimate form of power. Now to be careful, this is not merely a good kind of power. It's very condescending, potentially, among other things. But in all of this with Pros Prospero, and this anatomy of power that we learn from what he doesn't do, uh, we also, oh, sorry, along with this anatomy of power, we also learn from the things that he doesn't do here, right? and the things that he doesn't really understand about his situation. Um, that along with power as force, right? potestas, in other words, there is power as potential, right? as relationships, that is the capacity for joining with others to increase one's power, such as, for example, in empowerment. So the power and potential, the potentia, of Shakespeare's plays lies in the capacity to provide multiple angles to matters that nowadays tend to be forced upon us from monolithic, unnuanced perspectives, right? flat slogans, sound bites, simplistic identities. So my message here, in closing and in short, is that Shakespeare possesses a positive power of ambiguity, which generally speaking, I think we lack today. We need more narrative ambiguity in our lives, not less. We need to embrace that overflow of meaning, and possibility, and difference that otherwise results in anxiety and enjoy its beauties and complexities, rather than allowing our anxiety to turn to fear. Now that sounds very simple, right? Well, just don't be anxious. Well, but that's not the point. The point here is that from learning and studying these narratives and these stories and these ways, uh, we find a sort of narrative experience and a potentia that helps us better negotiate the conditions of modern life. Staring into the face of multiplicity and, and ambiguity, we want to be able to say with Miranda at the end of The Tempest, when her naivete and innocence is interrupted by the arrival of these newcomers that have been shipwrecked on the island, we want to say with her, oh wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here, how beauteous mankind is, oh brave new world that has such people in it.